Coming up on Network Africa. The United Nations says more than 1.8 million people in Mozambique have been affected by Cyclone Hidai, and some of them are in critical life threatening situations. CEO of Ethiopian Airlines, Tawadi Gibbonarian, says the preliminary report on the crash throwing 7.7 bats is expected this week or next. Son of former South African President Zain Zuma is on trial for homicide. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenyola Kuboele more than 1.8 million. That's the number of people the United Nations Humanitarian Agency says has been affected by Cyclone Hidai in Mozambique, and some of them are in critical life-threatening situations. Aid agencies are one in that thousands of survivors have yet to receive any help 12 days after it made landfall in southern Africa. Mozambique's Minister of Land and Environment says efforts are being made to get food, shelter, water, and medicine to people seeking shelter on higher grounds. He says the rescue need is reducing as the water recedes, but warned the area will take years to recover. Um, the people in need, which we calculate and which the minister and I discussed just now, the government are also seeing the increasing number. The total people affected are 1.85 million, 1.85 million. Uh, of those, we will target 1.72 million. The requirements, the funding that we are asking to fund the operation for the first three months is $281 million. Okay, that has been released, it has been sent out across the world, and governments already con uh, considering funding that appeal. And that funding is absolutely vital to support the operations we are doing in support of the government of Mozambique. Meanwhile, Mozambique is preparing for a cholera outbreak after a cyclone Hidai devastated the country. Large crowds of people waited for treatment at medical centers in the central district of Yara as government made preparations for a cholera outbreak. Nurses handed out chlorinated concentrate, which will act as a temporary solution to prevent waterborne diseases among the local population after the mass flooding. Gert Vern Dock, an emergency coordinator with the aid group Doctors Without Borders, said an epidemic could spread quickly due to Biera's dense population. Now, some good news for the families of victims of the Ethiopian airplane crash on the 10th of March. The CEO of Ethiopian Airlines, Tewoldo Gabrimariam, says he expects the preliminary release of a report into the crash of its Boeing 737 MAX 8 maybe this week or next week. He said the airline may or may not attend a briefing in the United States by Boeing about a planned update to software that is a focus of investigation in two deadly crashes that have prompted worldwide groundings of the 737 MAX. Boeing has come under intense scrutiny since the crash, the second in five months, involving its new 737 MAX 8 model. But despite this, Mr. Gabriel Merriam says the airline's relationship with Boeing is sound. I think we have taken the right decision to ground the airplane and the fact that we have taken that right decision was endorsed by the entire world because we cannot uh, put uh, even a single life at risk. The simulators, whether it is NG or MAX, they are the same because the simulators, neither the NG nor the MAX were designed are not still designed to simulate the MCAS. The MCAS is a new uh, story, mm -hmm. so it doesn't make any difference anyway. Um, as I told you, this is perhaps uh, a very rare occasion, uh, maybe the second in the aviation history, 
where an investigation is being conducted while the airplanes are grounded. This is the second next to the Concord uh, problems that we had before. Now, in the wake of the deadly attacks over the weekend in Mali, President Ibrahim Keita has visited survivors of the vicious killings. President Keita met with survivors in a local hospital, saying the army must be ready because the country is in a time of war. The attack on civilians at the villages of Ogusagu and Welingara on Saturday, which left the burnt bodies of women and children in their homes, has shocked a population familiar with unjustified attacks. Gunmen killed 134 Fulani herders in a surge of violence in the insurgency-played country. The ethnic bloodshed took place less than a week after a deadly assault by jihadists on an army post killed at least 23 soldiers, both in Mali's central region. Now, the son of South Africa's former president, Jacob Zuma, is on trial on a charge of culpable homicide at the Randburg Magistrate Court. Due to Zain Zuma is being persecuted over the death of Zimbabwe national Kumzile Dube, who was killed when his car collided with a minibus taxi in 2014. It was on a major highway in South Africa's economic heartland of Guateng. He has, however, pleaded not guilty. The state withdrew a second culpable homicide charge related to the death of Nanki Jeanette, another passenger in the taxi. Due to Zain Zuma first gained notoriety over his business relationship with the controversial Gupta family. He was charged with corruption and conspiracy to commit corruption related to his dealings with the Guptas. But the state withdrew the charges in January in what was seen as a major victory for Duda Zane. Now, South African journalist Becky Malid now joins us on the program to give us an update. Ella Becky, thank you for joining us on Network Africa. What is the outcome of today's hearing? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today we just saw uh, the trial beginning actually. Uh, we saw different uh, witnesses take stand, including the driver of the taxi that was involved in the taxi dance on that night. So uh, we saw uh, most witnesses uh, are still going to continue throughout the week. And then uh, the first witness was from the weather services who came there to confirm if it was indeed rainy that day. And then you also saw witnesses who were there to account for the car itself, uh, if uh, Mr. Zuma could have avoided the accident or was the car having enough features for him to avoid the accident. Can you help us understand this a bit more? We know the state withdrew a second culpable homicide charge related to the death of another passenger in the taxi. Why is that? And what exactly is the difference between this charge and the one he faces now? The other passenger did not die on the scene. The other passenger died in hospital. And it was established by the state that that passenger, that passenger had a pre-existing condition that she died from. So her death was not directly linked to the accident. And then the difference between that and this case that is going through now is simply the fact that uh, the current passenger or the, the Dube passenger did actually die on the spot and she did got impacted from the accident and as the witnesses stated that she was hanging out of the window of the taxi so she, she was directly affected by the accident unlike the other passenger. Okay, so Judah Zain is being persecuted over the death of Zimbabwe national Fumzile Dube. Has Zimbabwe made any comments concerning his trial? Uh, we did not get any official statement or anything like that from any Zimbabwean government or anything. So there's nothing official from Zimbabwe about it. Okay, what about former President Jacob Zuma? Any word from him? Well, not today, but previously in other court appearances, uh, the president, the former president was always there with him, by his son. But he has made it a point never to talk about it in public although he would show his appearance and sit next to him in court, but he never speaks about it in public. Okay, finally, Becky, if convicted, what punishment is Judah Zane likely to face? Uh, in South Africa, in courts, the highest uh, sentence for capable homicide is 10 years. Uh, it depends on the circumstances of the case, whether it was reckless or not. So it's up to the state to prove. So if it is proven that it was, he was actually in fault and he was reckless, 
then he can face up to 10 years. But then that can also be a suspended sentence where he can do some community work or anything like that. So it's entirely a rest upon the judge. Okay, we'll be keeping an eye on the story as the trial proceeds. Obeki Mali, thank you for joining us on Network Africa and giving us an update on that story. Moving on now, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has paid homage to the millions of Africans who suffered during the era of slave trade to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Addressing a meeting of the General Assembly, Mr. Guterres encouraged everyone to stand up against old and new forms of slavery by raising awareness of the dangers of racism. The transatlantic slave trade was the largest forced migration in history. The extensive exodus of Africans spread to many areas of the world over a 400-year period. Slavery and the transatlantic slave trade were among history's most appalling manifestations of human brutality. On this International Day of Remembrance, we pay homage to the millions of African men, women and children who were denied their humanity and forced to endure abominable, abominable cruelty across centuries. Since the time of the transatlantic slave trade, the arts have been used to confront slavery, to empower enslaved communities and to honor those who made freedom possible. Literature, music, poetry and other art forms have been vital tools in commemorating past struggles, highlighting ongoing injustices, and celebrating the achievements of people of African descent. Today, the artists, the writers, the poets who are committed to the struggle for racial equality and the empowerment should know we are with them. As we mark the International Day of Remembrance, let us resolve to carry their messages far and wide. Together, let us stand against old and new forms of slavery by raising awareness of the danger of racism in our time and by ensuring justice and equal opportunities for all people of African descent today. Three senior judges in Kenya are proposing lowering the age of sexual consent to 16 years from the current 18 years. A local newspaper says the three Court of Appeal judges are opposing lengthy jail terms imposed on young men for, in quotes, sleeping with teens who they say were willing to be and appear to be adults, end of quote. The judges are quoted again as saying, our prisons are teeming with young men serving lengthy sentences for having had sexual intercourse with underage girls whose consent had been held to be immaterial because they were under 18 years, end of quote. The judges cited a case where they reversed a jail term of 15 years imposed on a man for making a 17-year-old girl pregnant. Some citizens have rejected the proposal, saying this only gives room for a lot of gender and sexual violence on young and growing ladies. Well, while Kenya is trying to lower the age for sexual consent, a research institute, Women's Refugee Commission, has detailed the sexual horror suffered by migrants. According to a study published, refugees and migrants trying to reach Italy through Libya are victims of widespread and horrific sexual violence. Refugees and migrants end up becoming trapped in this nightmarish web of extortion, um, ex exploitation, abuse, sometimes slavery. And when we asked refugees and migrants about sexual violence against men and boys in Libya, they used language like, this happened to everyone. This is normal in Libya. They're doing this every day. And this happened to many, many of my friends. Um, and even for me personally, I've worked in humanitarian aid for around 16 years um, in over 20 emergencies. And these accounts were among the worst that I have ever heard. They are quite disturbing. Along the way, they encountered and this is prior to Libya, they encounter sexual violence at checkpoints, um, at border crossings, by being stopped by militias, armed groups, in prison. And although this culminates in Libya, which we'll talk more about in a moment, um, it's really important to underscore that 
that this is happening throughout their journey. Um, people kept telling us, um, it's not only Libya, it's not only Libya. Um, and one aid worker said, you know, Libya is just icing on the cake. Um, but this is happening through, throughout the migration route. You're watching Network Africa on channels television still ahead. Nigeria's literally open Gabriel Para dies at 97. Stay with us.